Hey, and welcome to the Stories Unveiled podcast, where we talk about the purpose in every story and how to live in freedom from your past. I am your host, Ashley Sears, and each episode, you're invited into a conversation about real life between me and a friend. I believe if an issue is addressed in the Bible, then it's important to create a safe and supportive space to discuss it. While some of these conversations are not easy, I do believe they are worth it. If you like what you hear, please visit our ministry at storiesunveiledconference.com. Thank you for joining today. Welcome to episode two of the Stories Unveiled podcast. I am Ashley Sears, and I am so honored to share this space with you. This episode, I have invited a dear friend of mine and walking buddy, Ashley Ingalls, to the studio, and we had an incredible conversation about fear, anxiety, and trusting God. Ashley is a Boise State graduate. She married her college sweetheart with two adorable children. She grew up in and out of the foster care system, and as a result of that, she understands the true value of relationships and that family isn't only defined as people you are related to. I really hope you find this conversation helpful. Today, Ashley and I are talking about fear and anxiety. We are not talking about it from a clinical point of view. But rather, how do we manage the daily overwhelm when we allow our worry to override what we know to be true about God? These can be big or seemingly small things, but it's all very real to us in the moment. I know no one is immune to struggling with this, but I do think that as moms, it's much easier to spiral. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, I want to start by addressing this fear and anxiety is really more of this like overwhelm and worry, right? Like I said, we're not talking clinically. We're just talking about, especially as moms, how we feel with just the daily worry of our kids, whether it's finances, health, all of these things. Um, You've struggled with this. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Can you tell me when you first realized that maybe this was an issue more than just maybe the norm? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's probably something I've always struggled with. I can't really remember a time where I just didn't have like this pit in my stomach sometimes. And so um, as you know, as I've talked with you before and as I gave my testimony at stories a few years ago, the conference, um, I had kind of a less than idyllic childhood. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I was with a single mom who struggled with bipolar disorder. And so a lot of my growing up was um, just unstable. Um, There was, you know, not the greatest of people around, um, just kind of (laughs) sketchy. And then in and out of foster care. I think that's probably where it started. Um, was probably my teen years was the most I can remember when it started. So the instability of growing up and not having a mom and a dad and a stable home, did you ever know what you were coming home to? Um, no, I mean, I, I think that's kind of the nature of bipolar that mm-hmm. I noticed with my mom is that you kind of, you never knew what you were going to get. Like she, I'd come home one day and she was a blonde and the next, like <sighs> I'd get home from school and she was a redhead or all the furniture would be, in a different place um, or we would be oh. moving um, mm-hmm. because she just I think she just couldn't live in her own mind. So it was really hard for her to take care of herself, let alone me. Yeah. Um, and so I think I was always just kind of on edge, like what, what's it going to look like today and yeah. that kind of stuff. Now, a little bit of a rabbit trail, but are you you're not an only child, correct? No, I'm so I'm the oldest biologically. Um, mm-hmm. I have two younger half brothers. Okay. And so um, by quite a bit, I'm nine and seven years older than them. OK. And they were in the picture and this was your guys's lives, too. Or you guys mm-hmm. had different kind of. So a little bit. So I was kind of like the parent figure to at least the middle, my middle brother, okay. um, a little bit just when he was a baby. Um and a little bit towards the younger one too, but his dad ended up, 
coming into the picture. So you've um, been momming since you were <laughs> since you were young. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, to some extent. Yeah, not sure how good I was at it when I was younger. You can ask my brother about that. But <laughs> you all survived. Yeah, we're, we're all here by God's grace. So. Um, okay, so. This kind of carries you through. We'll kind of just jump and fast forward a little bit. You had a little bit of an um, instability growing up. You were kind of in and out of foster care um, until you did find your forever home, right? Right. With an incredible family who I do know, and they are great. Um, But what are, was there a moment in your adult life when you realized I've like, I've got to get this under control. I've got to figure this out because um, when I say fear and anxiety and worry, I'm not just talking about the to-do list when you you know are trying to fall asleep at night or mm-hmm. significant crisis, mm-hmm. but even just what to some might be seemingly small. Like I'll I'll give an example. There was one year. Um, it was a terrible flu season. What year was your youngest <laughs> son born in? Because I think it was that it was winter. 2017, yeah. So is that the year that it was? Probably. It was 2017 mm. or 2018. Um, mm. Ashley is my walking buddy. We live pretty close to each other. And so we go walking and we talk about life and solve all the world's problems usually. Yeah. <laughs> but um, there was one flu season where I think I was spiraling because my kids were young and everybody seemed to be getting sick. I mean, it was crazy. And um, I think it was then that I realized I was having an issue with maybe it was control, but also just worry. Like I couldn't sleep at night because I had so much worry of things that I could do absolutely nothing about. And Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the worry and anxiety and fear that like deep rooted stuff that that we're talking about. So tell me um, about when you realized that that was kind of maybe more than just the average yeah, so that was probably when I finally like gave a name to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so my yeah, my youngest son was born in 2017, and I really think I struggled with postpartum anxiety that just kind of, you know, collided with the anxiety of my life. <laughs> um, and yeah, I remember just feeling like I couldn't even sleep, and I was like just on edge all the time. Um, I was worried to take him anywhere out of the house. Mm-hmm. Um, it drove my husband crazy. <laughs> Um, I remember be standing in Costco wearing him and he was probably, I don't know, he was probably two months old at the time and just like oh, having no. a panic attack being like, there are too many people around him. They're breathing on him, you know, and just <laughs> realizing like, I can't live my life like this. I'm going to drive a wedge between my husband and I and my kids. Um because so, you also yeah. have an older I do. child, too. Yeah, who she was, you know, two and a half at the time. And she's like, well, I just feel like she was always looking at me like, why are you so, like, <laughs> what's wrong with why you, Why can't Mom? I touch things? Like, what? <laughs> so, yeah, a little bit of germaphobe came out, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I remember, I think it was in the church lobby one time we were joking, you and I were joking because kids just like lick everything oh and put everything yeah. in their mouths. Mm-hmm. And I just remember it, like our, it was like, it's fine. We're fine. Mm-hmm. Everything's fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to yeah. be okay. Yeah. And gosh, for as much as I tried to protect my youngest, like he is the kid that will literally lick the ground. Like just I'm like and I had to. So I had to let it go. I was like, well, I either will die with this anxiety (laughs) over you or just realize like, all right, we got to just trust that God's got you because I don't. I can't do this by myself. Yeah. My son used to lick the bottom of his shoes. It was really gross. And yeah, it's just (laughs) it like it gives somebody who is like literally fearful of germs. I I was Mm -hmm. for a lot of years, especially Mm -hmm. when I started having children. You just have to kind of like throw it up and be like, all right, Lord, you you've got it way more than I do. Right. Um, So I'm going to I'm going to jump and we're going to talk a little bit about. Okay, so. You had your son, you put a name to this postpartum um, anxiety, just this kind of constant state of worry, Mm -hmm. I guess. Is that is that accurate? Yeah. Um, What were some things that kind of sent you, I guess, into a tailspin, for lack of a better phrase? Oh, gosh. Um, I know for me, it's just illness in general. Yeah, I think really just illness. But I think what it comes down to is the lack of control. Mm -hmm. Like um, 
And I think that's been the story for my whole life, just not ha- feeling like I had any sort of control or any, you know, ground to stand on. Like, um, so I think that's kind of like my biggest thing uh, with with my anxiety has yeah. been um, realizing that I'm not in control, you know, and I think that was the biggest thing. You know, I mean, I think we always have a sense that we have some sort of control and we really don't. Right. So, well, and I think that a lot of times when we grow up in situations where we don't have control, a lot of times the byproduct as we become adults grows unhealthy behaviors. A lot of times it can be addictions, but um, unhealthy behaviors also could be how we manage or deal with worry or fear or anxiety and so um to hold those thoughts captive and you know not that just praying everything away always works sometimes Mm -hmm. there are so many other external things that need to happen but um definitely staying grounded in what we know to be true about god and that he never changes and he has control over everything sure so um So I'm going to ask you, because this just, I think, plays right into, um, you guys went on a pretty cool vacation in July, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes. And that was something you guys were super looking forward to. And Mm -hmm. I think I even remember at one point, um, I think it was, because this is always our thing when we go on vacations, is as long as everybody stays healthy, (laughs) as long as everybody (laughs) stays healthy, it'll be a good vacation. Um, Your vacation was great from what I heard and what I remember. It was great. And you came home and not but just a few days, I think, after, wasn't it? Um, Something happened, or maybe it was a week or so, but something happened and you ended up having to take your son to the doctor for some stuff. Will you tell Mm -hmm. me about that entire situation in July? Yeah. So, I mean, like you said, we went, we took our kids to Disney World. Mm -hmm. It was super fun. We had a great time. Um, We were exhausted, but (laughs) um, yeah, it was just, it was great. And then we got home and I just, and I just feel like I, I call myself like a hoverer. I, I think it's part of like my nursing degree that comes out, but like I just notice little things. So my son, he was having like um, accidents at night mm-hmm. and it's not completely uncommon. He was four right. at the time. Right. And so it just, it was enough to kind of like make me think about it. And so I remember just running it by my husband being like, okay, Ben, if... um like, this has been happening a few nights. What do you think? Is it worth taking him in? And when he said yes, I was like, okay. So Because your husband, I'm just going to interject, your husband is a lot like my husband. <laughs> They're like the voice of reason. And right. when I know when I start to spiral and I'm like, but what about this? And what about that? And this was weird. And this was off. My husband's like, we're mm-hmm. fine. It's fine. Everything's right. fine. <laughs> yeah. And so when I got him to be like, yeah, I think it's worth getting looked at. I was like, okay. And um, he was drinking a ton of water. I remember that was the biggest thing. It was like mm. the night before I took him in, he like drank this huge cup of water. And I remember thinking, okay. And I knew in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, this, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm going to try and get some sleep. I'm going to give it to God. Yeah. And then the next day we're sitting in the doctor's office and I'm just convincing myself it's a bladder infection. He's fine. Um And our pediatrician walked in and she just, I could tell by her face. She was just like, I'm so sorry. I'm really glad you brought him in because there's glucose in his urine. Mm -hmm. And as a nurse, I knew immediately that's diabetes. And because he's young and he's healthy, it's type one. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like a gut punch. Like, what? (laughs) Like, what did I do? Like, I think, I mean, I know, you know, medically that this stuff just happens. Right. There's but, nothing you could have done about it. Yeah. But you just feel like you still question it. Like, what did I do wrong? And I remember just like, God, where are you in this? Like, well, and even like, <sighs> really, Lord, like, yeah, I struggle with mm-hmm. any time my kids get sick. I like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I know for me, it's like, really? One more, th- like, it's just another thing. Yeah. Now to worry about forever. Because I mean, this is yeah, it's uh, it's lifelong. It's autoimmune. Yeah. Um, he's on insulin injections every every day. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it just it changed our life very quickly. Um, we had to gather up all of our stuff and take him to the hospital for two days. Um, you had to take our our daughter. I did. Um, She's quite lovely. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad you guys were great with her. And um, yeah, it just I think that was like the biggest thing. Like I remember just sitting in the hospital, just like crying out like Mm -hmm. where are you like why why like I just felt like 
as a believer, like we're not immune to suffering. We know that. We know things that um, are hard that God uses still, but they're hard. He takes us through hard seasons. And I remember just feeling like, what? I just feel like I'm always in a season of hard, like, yeah. um, and just crying out like, why, why, why him? Why this situation? Like, I can't fix this. Um, And as moms, that's what we want to do, right? Yeah. We just want to fix it and take it away. Right. Yeah. And that was something I had to, um, like, luckily my adoptive mom, she's amazing, but she walked a really hard road with my brother, um, her biological son. He had Mm. epilepsy. And so I remember her telling me, like, you can go down these roads and everyone will seemingly have an answer Mm -hmm. um, for a price, right? Mm -hmm. But you're going to have to just trust that God's in the driver's seat of this, you know? Yeah. And so that's what I had to relinquish myself to because I'm I'm a researcher, yeah. right? And so you're it's, a nurse, <laughs> yeah. So it's like, okay, this is wrong. What can I do about it? And it was like God telling me, like, no, you need to calm down and trust me. Mm-hmm. Like this is the time that you need to trust me. And so you know, obviously we do what the doctors suggest. He's on insulin. Um, I've changed his diet so that. You know, we just try and keep manage it. Yeah. Just so that we're not having as much crazy blood sugar spikes and stuff like that. Um, so it was a you know, a little bit of a lifestyle change too. But um yeah, I had to just like realize there's no other answer out here. If there's gonna be healing that comes, it's gonna be through the Lord. Totally. And so I can't I can't rely on my own strength and this isn't gonna be the strength of man either. Right. And um it's funny. I told my mom, she told me this verse, the trust in the Lord with all your mm-hmm. heart and lean not on your own understanding. It's funny because I, for so long thought that is such a coffee mug verse, right? <laughs> like it's on coffee mugs until you really think about it, right? Yeah. Lean not on your own understanding. And so I had to tell myself, oh, I can't lean on anything that I know to be true. Mm-hmm. Like I can't look down the complications of this disease. I can't look at um, loss of life years. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to trust that God's got all of this because otherwise I am not going to be able to take care of this kid or my daughter yeah. or my husband or myself. Right. Which so, that's that's a very important thing is taking care of yourself or you won't be able to take care yeah, of anybody else. Yeah. And so I had to like just be like, okay, God. And as I'm sitting like in the hospital that night, like crying. And I'm t- my mom's giving me that verse and I'm holding my son because he's terrified that mm-hmm. he's not ever going to leave the hospital. <sighs> he finally falls asleep. And I remember thinking of um, that passage where it talks about Elijah. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, like God was not in the fire or in the storm, but he was in the still quiet voice. Mm-hmm. And that's where I felt like he's like, I'm still here. Yeah. And I had to just realize, like, okay, like, I've got to just trust that you're in this really hard situation, even though I don't see how this is going to be used for good. You do. Right. So. Well, that's actually a really great segue, too, because you said, I have to trust that, you know, I don't see how you're going to use this for good or and whatnot. But tell me about what was actually kind of cool in the sense of. When he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in that, I mean, essentially he was diagnosed right there in the pediatrician's office before you Mm -hmm. ever even went to the hospital. Right. But what was cool about that? Um, Because typically I don't for I don't know a ton about diabetes, although I do know somebody that was very dear to me that that had it Mm -hmm. um, or has it. But. Typically, when somebody is diagnosed with especially type 1 diabetes, they're in a pretty dire situation by the time they make it to the hospital. It Mm -hmm. usually takes significant illness, a lot of things before they actually get to the point of, oh, this is diabetes. And this this might be a lot of people's story. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the case for Luke, your son. So what was kind of cool about that where maybe you did see God's hand in this? So, yeah, I mean, looking back now, there was a lot that, you know, God was obviously in it. But um, so usually, yeah, kids are very sick usually when they get diagnosed. So when we took him to the ER, they were like, why? Why did you bring him in? What made you notice? He was up and walking. He was up and walking. He wasn't sick. Um, He had barely started to lose weight. Um, 
And so like the the measure that they use is called the A1C. Mm-hmm. Um, no, for normal people, it's, you know, fives usually. Um, diabetics, six and above, six and a half and above is usually what they say. And so to put it in perspective, most kids are diagnosed like in the teens, like 10, yeah. 11, 12, 13, 14 and up. So they're in a bad way. Yeah. So they're pretty sick. Um, Luke was when at diagnosis was 6.9. So barely just... Diabetic. Above that, di- mm-hmm. yeah, diabetes cutoff of six point five, um, and it's it's cool because like he he really wasn't sick. It was hard because he was in the hospital and like, why am I here? I feel fine, right? Um, but yeah, we never got to that significant illness, mm-hmm. um, you know, because kids can people can die of ketoacidosis yes. before they even get diagnosed. Absolutely. And, um, so I'm thankful in the sense that God kind of just like spoke to you know, my husband's heart and my mm-hmm. heart, um, you know, me being crazy, like <laughs> overanalyzing everything, I guess, worked to my favor at that <laughs> point. Um, but yeah, it, it was pretty, I was glad that he wasn't, you know, super sick. There was no significant medical trauma or just this no. huge um, other event around it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a pretty, I guess, seamless, if you have to say, diagnosis. Yeah. And um you guys were able to deal with it from a perspective of he's healthy. So let's keep him that way. Right. Um, never had to get to a really scary point, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so what are some other ways, if you can think of any, where just God has shown up, whether it's been in different situations or um, this situation with your youngest, or if there's mm-hmm. anything with your daughter, um, mm-hmm. In times of worry, um, it sounds like your mom, um, your adopted mom, mm-hmm. is a uh, rock for you mm-hmm. when it comes to scripture and um, helping keep you grounded in, you know, the truth about the Lord. Yeah. Um, but are there any ways that, you know, you have just seen like, OK, OK, Lord, I see you that have been able to give you reminders that he's there and he's got you? Yeah, I think for me, one of the biggest things that helps me is just looking back on all that has happened. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I talked about being, you know, with my unstable mom, bad situations, um, foster care. I mean, uh, even just finding the Lord. Gosh, in foster care, I was with atheists to Mm -hmm. Scientologists to Mormons to, you know, like I had like a tour of the religions um, (laughs) and then never really grew up with anything. And so then when I think about even just how I came to faith, like we we joke my adoptive family that I came at a yard sale (laughs) because I got invited by a friend at school to like come help out at this church yard sale. And then I just never left. Like (laughs) I just inherited a kid at a yard sale. So um, if I think about just that, like, I mean, that is, it's the God who knows no coincidence, right? Totally. Like he's, he's always working. And so I have to trust that that same God that saw this lost kid um, also sees me now, Mm -hmm. you know, also sees my son. And so, you know, and then going on to with motherhood and and with my daughter, um, you know, she had she had a tonsillectomy at four. And at the time, that seemed like a huge deal, too. And it was one of those things to just remember, like Mm -hmm. that he's in it. Um, So, yeah, I think really one of the big things is just looking back on all he's brought me through. And I think one of the things talking about just the anxiety and stuff and how I grew up, um, there was just a lot that was protective growing up in such the instability that I had to unlearn yeah, and that I'm still having to unlearn. You know, um, one of the things I think a lot of believers struggle with is just this idea of we don't need to earn it, you yeah. know, like we don't need to earn God's love or anything. And so when Luke was diagnosed, I immediately fell back into that. What did I do? Yeah. And I remember it was the night we brought him home and I was crying like my husband was asleep. Luke's blood sugar alarms are going off and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm so tired. I don't know how to do this. So I just flip open my Bible and I'm like, Lord, you need to talk to me (laughs) because I'm losing my mind. And I flip to John 9 of all things in this passage. I just read it's where there's um, a blind man outside Mm -hmm. the temple and his Jesus disciples are like, 
so was it his parents' sin or his yeah. sin that made him blind? And Jesus says, neither. Yeah. It's so that the glory of God can be revealed to him. Mm, and so I've good. just clung to that. I don't know what that means in his life. You know, I know one day he will be healed, whether it's in this life or the next. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But I just pray that over him every day, that the glory of God will be revealed through this whole situation, through his life, through my life trying to navigate this. Yeah. Um, That's so, so yeah. good. Well, we know that God wastes nothing right? and that there's purpose in everything that happens. I believe that. So even though these events in your life um, have been hard and overwhelming and have caused so much worry, anxiety, even fear, um, we know that it's not wasted. And we may not know now or you may not know now what um good can come out of it, but this is going to be a part of your son's story, mm-hmm. you know, and um, it's awesome that your son will get to have a testimony of look what God has done, you know, through me, my mom. Um, and so just these moments where um, you can see God move and mm-hmm. his presence and these things are just preparing you for other Mm -hmm. things because our life is not over right (laughs) we are still here you are still here momming and um you know inevitably there's going to be other things probably not as big as a diabetic a diabetes Mm -hmm. diagnosis but who knows and so these little reminders and um practices i guess i'll say these tests um i'm assuming are just good practice to prepare you for whatever else is to come Yeah, well, and I think, you know, just these things, they tether us to God, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think about it, and it's like, gosh, where could I go? Mm -hmm. Like like Peter said to him, you know, you have the keys to life and death, right? You're the answer. And I think about that now, like, just— gosh, I rely on you so much. Like, where where would I go? There's nowhere. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I think we've seen that. You know, we've talked about in other situations in our lives just where that's true. So absolutely. Well, I just have one last question for you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I want to ask you for the person that's listening to this who has um, anxious thoughts or is potentially living just a very anxious life, um, who has fear of the unknown and uh, has difficulty with um, the ability of just relinquishing and letting letting God take control in scary situations, what would you say to them with somebody that's maybe in your shoes, not necessarily a diabetes diagnosis, mm-hmm. but just the that overwhelming sense of daily worry that is just can be paralyzing or mm-hmm. can put that pit in your stomach, all of those things for the person listening that is like, wow, that's me. What would you, what would you say to them? Whether um, it's an encouragement or anything. Yeah. I mean, I understand. And I think it's just realizing that it's an everyday thing. Mm-hmm. You have to wake up every day and remind yourself who God is. Yeah. Um, there's some days that I do that really well. There's some days I really don't do it well at all. Yeah. Um, and just, I think, I think that I always looked at it like, God, heal my anxiety and take it away. Mm. And that doesn't always happen, right? He can. You know, he can. But, <laughs> and we know but that. But will he? Yeah. But will he? And sometimes I think he uses it to keep me tethered to him. Yeah. Um, kind of like Paul said, his crutch or, you know, this Mm -hmm. thorn in the The side. Um, That's, and I just think I would tell people, you know, just trust, look, look to who he is. Mm -hmm. Look back on all the things that he's done in your life um, and how he's used those really hard times. Um, That's really what I've, I've had to do is just remind myself, okay, you are the same God now as you were then you never change and so you know that's hang on to his promises yeah of who he is yeah and you're still here yeah you're here to, to continue to tell about it yes yeah that's awesome well thank you so much ashley i really appreciate your time and you being here and uh, just your insight and your vulnerability so yeah. thank you so much thanks so much for having me of course Thank you so much for joining us for today's conversation on the Stories Unveiled podcast. We would love it if you would leave us a rating or review. If you would like to learn more about Stories Unveiled and our events, go to storiesunveiledconference.com or follow us on Facebook or Instagram at storiesunveiled underscore. 
The Stories Unveiled podcast is created in partnership with KTSY and Barefoot Media Ministries. For more encouragement and other podcasts, visit ktsy.org. Have an incredible day and go live unveiled.